Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as you, you heard that message that this meeting is being recorded, I will try to record these lectures because a lot of, there are a couple of people who won't be able to attend these lectures. Also, so that you have these for uh, review. Uh, one small thing that uh, I don't think it should record your uh, audio, um, it, but it might record your audio. So if you do ask a question with your audio enabled, that will mean that, well, your audio will be broadcast to the public. So when, when if you do that, you also agree to that. Uh, you can always ask via chat. Uh, that way your voice is not broadcast to anybody if you feel uh, unsure about that. Um, but okay, so let's do the share screen again. Um, okay, excellent. So, uh, this some things about the course logistics. Um, maybe the biggest thing I want to highlight is that we have, uh, it's a very homework-based class. Uh, we are 50% homework. Uh, there will be two midterms uh, and a final. The midterms are each 15% and the final is 20%. All of this information is on the syllabus that's on the CCLE. So I won't, you see the dates here, uh, but you will also find them there. Now, uh, resources and how this course is gonna be conducted is it's a mixture of uh, lectures uh, in, I mean, lectures or you could call these course meetings that will be a little bit different than maybe standard lectures, uh, but they're more lecture-like, certainly. Uh, so we will have, this Monday lecture will occur every week. We'll have this Monday lecture every week. Uh, and this, the goal of that is at least to talk, make it clear what the week is about and to uh, start the discussions of that week. Uh, we will also have a lecture on Wednesday, but I will change the time for that. So the official course, this week we will have Wednesday 12 to one. Uh, I will announce uh, during this week what time we will have it after that. Now, uh, I don't know if any, but any of those students are here currently because, but as you know, many of our fellow, your fellow students, uh, are in Asia currently, and there it is 3 a.m. Uh, and I don't think they are up now, they perhaps some are, uh, but uh, for them specifically, I have different times. So there is a Wednesday uh, lecture that will be at 3, uh, 3 p.m. China Standard Time. Uh, and then there will be two office hours for mostly people in, in the States, Tuesday and Thursday, uh, Tuesday 11 to 12 Pacific Standard Time, Thursday 10 to 11. Uh, and then there will be Friday at 3 p.m. China Standard Time, uh, a uh, more, more office hour-like way for the uh, interact. So this way, hopefully, whatever time zone you are at, uh, you are able to find some time to actually see me uh, interact with me. Uh, live. Uh, if you really cannot do any of these times, please do let me know um, in a private message uh, or uh, some other way. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, the TA, I don't believe he has yet announced his times. Uh, he should do that well before his discussion, uh, which is uh, tomorrow. Uh, so you, you should expect to hear from him about his uh, office hours and the Zoom meetings uh, for them. Uh, yes, oh yeah, he's here. So very soon, very soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there, uh, there will not be, I do not plan to have a Friday lecture uh, currently. And there will be, I mean, there, there is this lecture uh, or office hour on Friday for people who are in Asia. Uh, there will be supplemental videos. Uh, so, but if you are in the US, there is no class meeting on Friday currently scheduled. Uh, 
uh, if there's a need, if I feel that we need more class time, then I will uh, announce one. But at currently, we do not have a Friday meeting uh, for the class. Uh, now, uh, so we have two, primarily two class meetings, uh, Monday and Wednesday. Uh, but then supplementing those, there will be a bunch of short videos. Uh, I will try to make them really short. The existing ones are 30 minutes. Uh, my goal is more like uh, 15 minutes, but let's see how well I succeed in that. They're, ideally, they focus on single concepts that are better explained in a short video than in a longer lecture. And with all of these things, we'll be experimenting over the course. Hopefully, they will improve and become more useful during these first two weeks. Um, in terms of reading, we have three textbooks that you can use, um, but uh, they all have serve a little bit different goal. Uh, so Terence Tao's book is the uh, sort of official textbook for the class. Uh, it's more of an outline of these topics. It gives you the definitions of different things, uh, but it doesn't really prove a whole lot. Uh, and I know a lot of people want to learn proving. So in that way, that book is not ideal, but it does give you the outline, does give you the definitions and important examples. Now, the book that you wanna go for more detailed proofs, uh, there are two options, uh, slightly depending on uh, level of difficulty. Uh, there's Pew's book, um, which is called Real Mathematical Analysis. Uh, that is slightly, it is slightly challenging, uh, but it's more, uh, I'd say easier than the alternative. Uh, and it's nice because it has a lot of pictures and a lot of other content that you might find very appealing and uh, helpful. Uh, Rudin's book is very hardcore. It's definitely the classic in real analysis. It, so it's the full treatment of everything that we discuss. So I definitely suggest that as supplemental reading but I would prioritize reading Pew first. Uh, now, so these are the lectures and the videos, the plan for those. Uh, additionally, there is uh, CCLE. CCLE I will mostly use for posting homework, posting uh, a weekly uh, outline of what we discussed that, that will include the reading for each uh, week. Uh, and then, uh, but otherwise I don't, uh, so for some announcements, I will also use CCLE that I find very important and I want to make sure that all of you get in your email. Uh, and then the primary place where I hope people will discuss a lot is Campus Wire. Uh, and I want to show a little bit uh, what it looks like in case you haven't been there. Just some of the features that you may find um, uh, useful. Uh, so, yeah. So um, all of you should be on here. If you are not, uh, then contact me. I will add you. Uh, apologies. Um, so we have, uh, there's a news feed here. I will put all the announcements here. You can sort it by category that you want to look at. Uh, so there's week one, things related to that. Uh, there is uh, exams, coronavirus. Uh, you can also just look at all of them and lab just look at the ones that you haven't read, et cetera. Uh, there are direct messages. You can send each other direct messages, just the TA. You can send me messages. I will certainly look at those. Uh, currently, I've had the pleasure of seeing a lot of your uh, introductory messages where you tell me a little bit about yourself. If you haven't sent those, I very much enjoy uh, seeing them and getting to know you uh, and things that you want to learn in this class, etc. Uh, another feature I want to highlight here, and I would very much like to see people use, uh, is these uh, chat rooms. Um, and uh, specifically, the one I want to spend a a few minutes on is uh, uh, these two chat rooms on uh, looking for study groups and uh, looking for study group members. Uh, so 
in live instruction, uh, study groups are an important thing. People meet up, do homework together. Uh, I don't think it should be any less of an important component, even if we're doing things virtually. Uh, but of course, you have to take your own initiative in creating those. So if you want to study with somebody, if you want to do your homework jointly with somebody, I recommend that you make a post here, or, or if you know somebody from the class, you collect a group of people. If you want somebody else to join, you can then also look for other people to join. So hopefully, uh, either through this forum or otherwise, you form uh, group meetings uh, for this class. Uh, and uh, you can meet on Zoom, you can schedule your own Zoom meetings, meeting times, uh, or you can just exchange emails and messages or whatever format you feel is the most appropriate. But I think studying together with other people is much more effective uh, than studying by yourself. Uh, okay, uh, now, does anybody have a question on any of any things I said or any of the things I didn't talk about relating to logistics, the course, or anything else that's on their mind? Uh, you can just write in the chat. You can also unmute yourself if you feel like it. I'll wait a few minutes in case somebody wants to add a few seconds to see if somebody wants to ask a question. Uh, the, all of the lectures will be available the entire quarter. Uh, now, I do recommend that you generally attend uh, the lectures uh, because that's a way that you can give me feedback, uh, you can ask questions, uh, you can, uh, so it gives you a chance of actually making it interactive. Uh, so certainly, uh, yeah. You do not have homework on the first week. The first homework will be due next week. Uh, I will announce the homework probably either tomorrow or on Wednesday, but it will be due next week on Friday. It's always due on Fridays, but we don't have a homework during the first week. Uh, so you will have access to all of these resources, even if you are not officially enrolled in the class. Anybody who was added, there is no mechanism that you're uh, enrolled. Uh, access to this material will end. Um, I know that this, there's a lot of interest in this class. Uh, we, it, it, this meeting itself has uh, 57 attendees. Uh, we will not increase enrollment beyond 50, uh, at least unless the department somehow magically gives us a greater. At this point, I don't unfortunately expect this to happen. Uh, so, uh, it may mean that some people have to seriously consider whether they can take the concurrent section by Professor Brown. Uh, I don't know the capacity situation there. Uh, there might be that some people have to consider taking the, the course in a different order, unfortunately. But there, everybody's free to audit this material regardless. Uh, the exams, I plan on giving a at least a 24-hour window uh, when I did last quarter uh, finals, I gave a longer window of 36 hours uh, to accommodate for time difference, uh, it, so that uh, especially in the students in Asia wouldn't be disadvantaged, uh, or in Europe would not be disadvantaged by the time difference. Um, uh, and uh, so about the group, yeah. Uh, I do want to just, so we had, yeah, in my previous classes, we have had very nice uh, experiments with uh, group work in the office hours. Uh, I do want to, uh, we might not do very much of that the first week, but definitely uh, the following weeks, I want to include some interaction in the office hours that's more focused on group work. So my idea for that currently is that I will design worksheets or we will just work based on the homework. Uh, we may divide students into groups of about four students, uh, and then I will go around the rooms and we will we'll try to prompt discussion and help that discussion to happen. So yes, we will explore uh, trying to do some interactive work in uh, one of, at least one of the office hours. Um, the lectures, maybe not so much. Um, 
So about the past, not past, this is an important thing. The university allows you to switch to past, not past grading. However, your major may not allow you to do so. Uh, so if you do that change, be make sure to first check with your academic advisor or your department that this is actually something that won't affect your graduation. I know this is confusing. I find this policy myself a little bit uh, very confusing. Uh, but do not change to pass, no pass, unless you are absolutely sure that you're allowed to. Math majors cannot do that. You cannot graduate with a math major unless uh, or all of your math courses have to be with a number grade. Uh, so uh, I would not, if you are going to buy a book, buy uh, Rudin's Principle of Real Analysis. Uh, Pew's and Tao's book are both accessible as full PDFs on Springer link. There's uh, on Campus Wire, one of the chat rooms gives you instructions on how to access them. Uh, and I can also post on Newsfeed uh, a link for that. So I would not recommend buying either Pew's or Tao's book. If you want to buy, if you really like them, either of them, I would recommend Pew's out of, the, out of those two if you prefer a print version, an online version. Rudin's is the only one that at least officially is not available online. Um, so yes, and as Zach very well points out, Rudin is, if you ever intend to do any further study or really like mathematics, Rudin is an undisputed classic. So uh, it's definitely something that's good to own in your bookshelf. Uh, so that's the only one I would recommend spending your money on. Uh, but I think that's most of the questions. If Feel free to add more things here. I will look at them towards the end of the class. Uh, maybe it will be going a little bit over time. But I want to start uh, discussing the course matters uh, so we have enough time to cover them, uh, those that I want to discuss today. Okay. So... Uh, some of you may have already looked a little bit at these videos I posted on uh, YouTube, but this will be a little different. So the first lecture, the main topic is about what is a metric space. Uh, and I want to give some simple motivation about why we would care uh, and what is a metric space trying to encapsulate sort of in common or applied terms. Well, we all have... Uh, heard about uh, social distancing uh, and uh, what's one way of representing social distancing uh, is uh, we have different individuals, objects, and we have the distance, in be distance between these people, which in the case of social distancing should be at least six feet, or at least that's the official US guidance. Some countries give it different instructions, but... Uh, Another example of distances uh, and uh, what we mean by distance is more geographical concerning distances between say cities or uh, distances or in this case flight time between cities in the United States. This map is not particularly uh, well drawn, uh, but you can certainly recognize that it's the United States and you have cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, at Chicago, New York, and Miami. Between each of them, I haven't drawn all, the, all these lines, there's a flight time. Uh, and say between uh, Seattle and Miami, that flight time is about five hours. Uh, and there are some features uh, that flight times share. For example, the flight time to, uh, from Seattle uh, to uh, New York City is approximately the same as the flight time from New York back to Seattle. So, I mean, you could argue that this is not quite, the tr quite true because there are wind patterns that make the flight in one direction actually faster than the other direction. But uh, in some sense, we agree that there's a symmetry in these conditions. We also agree that say the flight time 
from Seattle to Miami is at most the flight time that it would take to go from first from New Seattle to New York and then from New, New York to Miami. So adding a layover will increase your flight time. Now, so that's some practical cases where you do get distances, distances between people or distances between cities. But another very relevant application, actually something I've also done research on, very little, uh, is uh, rankings of documents based on their similarities. Uh, you could take the Wikipedia article on Sylvester Stallone, a generic uh, New York Times article talking about dogs, or an oddly satisfying Reddit post. And you could talk about how sim similar these are. And there are different measures of similarity that people use, but what's common in them is that you, it gives the similarity if it's actually done in some systematic way is given by some number. And that number should satisfy certain properties that we associate to distances. And depending on your application, you'll use a little bit different distance functions. So that, these are some practical reasons why you might consider uh, thinking about distances and what, where do the axioms or properties of distances come from? Now, we are, our setting is slightly more abstract. It's uh, one of the themes in this class is that we take the concepts from single variable real analysis from calculus and from Math 31A, 131A. We take those into more general cases, uh, including higher dimensions. So in single variable case, we had the idea of a convergence of a sequence. And that could be codified by saying that if you take n sufficiently large, so there exists a capital N, such that xn is close to x. So already this has an idea of a distance. Well, how did we write it precisely with quantifiers? was that for every epsilon, so for every distance that we prescribe, there exists a capital N such that if N is greater than or equal to capital N, then the distance from Xn to X, or how close that is, is less than epsilon, less than or equal to epsilon. And similarly, if we look at continuity, this can be phrased by a similar conglomeration of quantifiers for every epsilon, there exists a delta positive such that if your variables are close enough, then the function values will be close. So this is continuous at x, continuity at x. Uniform continuity, of course, wouldn't refer to X and would look very similar to this. But if we step back and look at these conditions, what we look, what we notice already from how we read these is that they involve only the distance between the points. The distance here is measured by absolute value of X minus Y which on the real line signifies the distance between these points. And this in general is what we call just an abstract distance function, distance x to y that takes in two, two points or two objects from your space, x and y, and outputs a real number that signifies the distance between them. Now, what is, so in general, a distance function is just that. It takes in two, two numbers, x and y, and it gives you a real number. And this we can write in this form. So x cross x, here is the collection of pairs of points that are either, that are both in x. And x here is just some collection of objects. Mathematically, it has to be a set. But we, 
for us, anything almost is a set. We're not going to go very deep into the set theory of things, but so it's just a function, but we want this function. We want to allow arbitrary sets x. So it can be cities, it can be people, it can be real numbers, it can be vectors, as we will discuss. Uh, it can be functions. Uh, it can be all sorts of different objects for which we can define a distance. But we do insist that this distance satisfies some of the properties that we associate with the distances that come from these applications. Say. Uh, so some of the common features that we associate with distances are positivity for every pair of points. And usually I will call these points because I really imagine these somehow being geometric objects lying in space. The distance between every pair of points is non-negative. Now, that's one of the things. We don't allow negative distances. Uh, now, the second property we assume is that if the distance is zero, so for all of these quantifiers, you, also these conditions, you should is, add the quantifier for every x and y, if for every x and y, if distance is zero, then the points actually have to equal. Same here for every x and y. So, these are the two conditions that we assume that match somewhat our idea of, say, flight time between cities. Flight time is always non-negative. Uh, the only case where the flight time is zero is if you don't even have to take off, meaning you start from the same place where you end. Uh, symmetry uh, means that for every pair of points, the distance from x to y is equal to the distance of y to x. Also fairly reasonable uh, assumption for a lot of distances. It's not always true. Uh, say the flight time between cities is an example of a case that's not completely symmetric uh, as, as we indicated in that example, but it's often a reasonable assumption uh, for distances and captures many features that we associate with distances. Now, and the final property uh, of distances that we require is this idea of doing a layover. layover. Doing a layover always increases distances. It always increases flight time, as pretty much everybody is aware. So distance from x to z is always less than the distance from x, if you go from x to y first, and then after that, go from y to z. So there's natural geometric reason why this is called the triangle inequality. If we associate, call the distance between a pair of points, it's normal distance, and we'll soon give a formula for this. Well, the distance from x to z, indicate that in here in blue, is less than the distances the sum of the distances of going through a third point y. And it's reasonable. This is true in the plane. This is true on the real line. So it's reasonable to assume that this is always true. Now, uh, as I discussed a little bit on Campus Wire, uh, in, there's a newsfeed post talking about metric spaces. Uh, in the comment there, I discussed that these are not the only assumptions you can put. Depending on your applications, you might want to relax these assumptions in different ways, but these are the assumptions to be a, a metric space. Uh, some examples of things, how things can fail, for example, positivity. And if you are in general relativity, uh, your metrics there do not give positive numbers. They mean a different thing. They're not exactly distances. Uh, but, and each one of these, you could find a counterexample of some rel closely related concept where it's not satisfied. But uh, we do insist that metric spaces satisfy all four of them. So if you have a space X and such a function D, we call that pair a metric space. So 
Now, the most simple metric space that comes from 131A uh, is the real line. The real line where the distance between two pairs of points is measured by the absolute value of their difference. Very naturally. Well, so this is intuitively, this is a distance. We certainly grasp that somehow it is measuring the distance between the pair of points. But uh, in a proof-based class, we must verify that it satisfies the properties that we are imposing on a distance. So we have the real line. We have the distance function x to y. And the absolute value is defined as we normally would define it. And now I want to prove that this is a metric. Well, we have four conditions. This proof must therefore verify all of these four conditions. There is positivity. Um, oh, by the way, there, yeah. Uh, there's positivity, there's zero, there's symmetry, and then there's the triangle inequality. Uh, and also, I should have said this much earlier, but uh, yes, these will be, these beautiful notes will all be online with the comments that I've added throughout the lecture. Well, I will upload this online. Now I do, maybe you will find it useful to make your own note, some notes yourself to stay focused. Uh, at, le uh, at least I find that easier with these virtual classes. Okay, well, positivity. Uh, so I'll try to tr try these, do these proofs as carefully as possible. So we really check everything that needs to be done. Uh, so uh, many of these are very intuitive, but still one needs to check them only using the definition and simple logic that comes from that. So this is an absolute value function as piecewise defined. So each of these cases will have within the, each of these, properties, when we check them, they will have cases inside them that we have to go through. So positivity, uh, x non-negative, x less than zero, uh, and the similar in, in all of these. We have to somehow involve these cases going through. So uh, in the first case, positivity. Well, we all know that absolute value is positive, but let's see how it's actually proven just to prove this point. So when x is non-negative, by definition, absolute value of x is equal to x. Well, x was assumed non-negative, so this is non-negative. Neg Great, done. x negative, well, in this case, absolute value is equal to minus x. And since x is negative, minus x is positive. So therefore, absolute value of x, which is equal to minus x, will also be positive. In particular, it's non-negative. Done. So it's fairly straightforward checks. Now the zero property, it's a little bit uh, uh, more tautological. Now when x is non-negative, uh, sorry, yeah, not x. Uh, now we have, uh, and this should be, yeah, so this shows that absolute value of x is non-negative. Non so therefore, distance x to y, we have to involve two x and y, which is given by x minus y. Now, absolute value of anything is non-negative. So therefore, absolute value of x minus y is non -negative. So for a zero axiom, I divide directly into these cases. So x minus y is non-negative, -neg x minus y is less than zero. Well, in the case where it's non-negative, suppose that distance x to y is equal to zero. Well, distance x to y is equal to x minus, absolute value of x minus y. x minus y is non-negative. So x, absolute value of x minus y is equal to x minus y by case. And now zero, is equal to x minus y, so x is equal to y. And this is what we want to show, is that this assumption, that distance is equal to zero, gives us that they are equal to zero. 
Similarly for the negative case, let's assume now the assumption dxy is equal to zero. Well, this time, x, absolute value of x minus y is mi negative of that. So it's y minus x. And then we again conclude that x, minus, x is equal to y. But then it's better to state that x minus y is actually equal to zero, which is a contradiction to the assumption in the case. This contradicts the other case. OK. So uh, yeah. Now, symmetry, uh, this is done quite similarly. Uh, Actually, this one I will skip, yeah. Uh, just because I think it's good, a good exercise to do that. So when case x is positive uh, and case x is negative, if you, ver you can verify these by the definition of the absolute value. Now, if you apply these, what we get is that distance x to y which is absolute value x minus y is equal to the x absolute value of minus x minus y, which is absolute value of y minus x, which is by definition distance y to x. And this shows the symmetry because distance x to y is equal to distance y to x. And finally, the triangle inequality, I mean, this is probably something you see it saw in math 131a. So I will not spend uh, very much time on this. Uh, so first, uh, if you start off from minus absolute value of x less than or equal to x less than or equal to absolute value of x, and minus absolute value of y less than or equal to y less than or equal to absolute value of y, and summing up these, we get that x plus y is between absolute value of x plus absolute value of y, and it's greater than or equal to minus the same thing. So you have a number between this number and its negative. This implies that absolute value of x plus y is always less than or equal to absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. OK. So uh, now how does this relate to distances? Let's fix for every x, y, and z. Well, the distance from x to z is equal to x, absolute value of x minus z. This is the same thing as if we subtract y and add it back. Now, this is our x. This is our y corresponding to these x and y, which are now different than in the statement. So the absolute value of this sum is less than the absolute value of its parts, this usual triangle inequality for absolute values. But this is exactly the same now as distance x to z plus the x to y plus distance y to z. And then we've indeed shown that distance x to c is less than or equal distance x to y and y to c. So there's a question about uh, the zero case. Uh, so in the negative case, there is, uh, when we do the proof, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, When we do the proof, we end up in the point where x is equal to y. Well, that's fine. Uh, that is what we wanted. Uh, so there is, in a sense, no, this is also fine to state. But uh, it's, uh, it's contradictory to the assumptions that we make. Namely, we're assuming that x minus y is strictly less than 0. 
So it's impossible for x to be equal to y. So in fact, if distance x to y is equal to zero, uh, zero then the second case doesn't happen at all. Because you have to be equal to zero, so you're not strictly less than zero in this case. So the zero prop, yeah. Uh, so that case, it, it looks a little weird. I, I agree, uh, but um, sometimes that zero check, especially with absolute values, it does look a little bit weird that way. But okay, so using these values of properties of absolute value, and there will be a note how this is generalized to other norms, um, uh, or a video on how this is generalized to other similarly behaving quantities called norms. So we get that the distance on the real line given by the difference of the, the absolute value of the difference is indeed the distance. Okay, uh, so you'll certainly need to do, be able to do this check. And this is one of the basic checks that you need to do. Now, some examples of this. Uh, I won't now prove that these are distances, but to give you a host of examples to work from. So in the plane, if we have two points, x2, y2, and x1, y1, and the distance between them is given by the usual Pythagorean, or one of the distances, the so-called L2 distance, is given by the familiar expression involving the Pythagorean law. I mean, the, you've, all the, most of you have seen this in high school. Uh, all, all of you should have seen it in high school. Uh, there is an analog of this in higher dimensions. If you have, say, three-dimensional points or more, so x1, x2, up to xn, and say another point, this time I'll indicate this up, uh, because I cannot use the same letter. So x, thank you, uh, xn to y1 through yn. And the distance between these is given by, again, applying a similar idea from Pythagorean law, but taking the differences, some of the differences of all the components. So x1 minus y1 squared, x2 minus y2 squared, plus all the way up to xn minus yn squared. Now, some of these properties for the metric are very, very straightforward to verify. Positivity is easy, easy-ish to verify. This is a square root of a positive number, some squares. If you look at the zero property, uh, it's also not very hard to verify. The symmetry, also not very difficult to verify because you have the square you can switch the role of x, x and y's in this definition. So these can be switched without changing the expression because negative squared is one. However, the third property, the triangle inequality is not super easy to prove. There's a separate video when I just, where it is titled inequalities, it's already on YouTube, that discusses how to prove this directly. Uh, so, I'll probably expand that a little bit to make this point clearer. Now, there are a host of other norms that you might look at. Uh, right now, I won't discuss that now because our time is almost up. I will give some material on that. But uh, I want to define some things. So this was just what is a metric, how to prove that something is a metric space. So. We need a language to describe and talk about metric spaces that works in all these different contexts. And one of these, and some of these language terms I will already cover now. So one of these is a definition of what is a ball in a space. So a ball, we have a metric space XD. Uh, a ball BXR, is the collection of points y 
inside x that are within distance r from that point. So here, r is some non-negative number. Uh, this is crucial. Negative number, this wouldn't really make sense because distances are always non-negative. Another crucial thing here, it's a matter of convention, but balls will be open balls. This terminology is slightly perhaps, um, well, it co coincides with the notion of open below, but uh, it's one has to be a little bit careful for that with that terminology. But where it comes from is that uh, in the plane, uh, say if we take the origin as our point, and if we take the ball centered at the origin with radius one. Well, what do we get? Do we get those points y uh, in R2 such that the distance of y to the origin is less than one? Well, the distance of the points, those points whose distance in the normal distance is less than one, cons consists of the interior of the unit ball. And why we call it open is, well, the boundary is not included. Uh, on the real line, uh, if we take, say, x, and uh, let's now give a different delta radius, then what this consists of is all the points y such that the distance, which is defined as x minus y, is less than delta. And this you can write in interval notation. So this is the same as the half open interval x minus delta to x plus delta. So it's centered at x and has width delta. And the endpoints are not included. some examples of open balls, but these exist much more generally, of course. So uh, there's space here for another norm that I don't now have time to discuss. But now what is an open set? Uh, balls are fairly simple objects, but we need more complicated sets, uh, especially in higher dimensions. Balls are quite not sufficient. We need squares different shapes. So, and for them, we need a language that describes them. And open set is one of the first terms that we introduce for these. Uh, and an open set, it, intuitively, it is a set where you always have a little bit of room. So, uh, formally, what we mean by a little bit of room is that we can fit a small ball inside the set. So we say, that omega subset of x is open if for every point inside omega there exists some small radius epsilon such that if we take all the points within distance epsilon of x then this is still contained in x omega so in terms of quantifiers this would be there exists an epsilon positive. So for every x, I'll go just a few minutes over time. If you need to go, you can always see these last minutes afterwards. So for every x in omega, there exists an epsilon such that if the distance x to y is less than epsilon, distance and more generally, the distance function x to y is less than or equal to epsilon, then also y has to be in omega. So this is just saying the same thing with slightly more quantifiers. We'll see that many of these properties actually can be written in many different ways. Now, I won't prove this now since we don't have time. Uh, I will add some material on this uh, though. So if I take but one example of an open set, uh, you, you should also be discussing in, in the discussion more of these. So if I take all the points in the plane, 
where the y component is positive, then this is an open set in R2 in the metric that we defined. Uh, the picture is fa fairly intuitive. If I take all the points in the with y component positive, so this is my set H. And if I take any point inside here, then there's a small, uh, sorry, I might've broken up out of there. So if you take the upper half plane with Y component positive and you take any point inside there, then there is some radius that's entirely contained inside the ball. Okay. So, uh, there's an excellent question. What if epsilon is super big? Well, the problem is not, it's similar to continuity. There exists an epsilon. So if you have some epsilon, I'll draw a picture of this. So, uh, well, um, imagine some fairly complicated set but that doesn't include its boundary. Now, I have some fixed point inside this. So this is my omega, which is the bound, region bounded by this space. Now, I could take a largest, ep, large epsilon, and it could still work. But if that epsilon works, then also a smaller epsilon will work. So this condition actually becomes easier to satisfy if you have a smaller epsilon. Now, it's saying that there exists an epsilon. So a very large epsilon may not work. So this is a too large epsilon. So exists an epsilon, just one. You epsilon because we think of it as being small and this is really a condition about it being small. There existing a small, a little bit of room. We don't know that it's a lot. So that's why we assume epsilon, we call it epsilon because we imagine it being small. But once one epsilon works, then everything smaller than that works. Uh, now, just in case somebody wants to leave, uh, uh, this is the end of the lecture. I will answer questions for the next few minutes at least uh, uh, that come up on the forum. Form. Yeah, if you have any questions on this material uh, or logistics of the course, feel, feel, feel free to stick around. There is also the office hours uh, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow there will be mostly like a Q&A session uh, so definitely focus more on the logistics. We'll maybe add some more things. Okay, so there's a question on the running over the triangle inequality proof. I'd be happy to go over that again. So uh, here, yeah, the logic, uh, so there was a two parts of this proof really. There was a general inequality. There was first a claim uh, that for every x and y, absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. I mean, you can use this property. This is certainly something that you should know from all of your previous classes. But uh, just to start slow, I also proved it here. So the proof of this claim is here. Now for every X and Y, it is true that absolute value of X, X is between absolute value of X and minus absolute value of X. Uh, and Y is between absolute value of Y and absolute value of minus Y. And just interject here. Yes, I will upload these notes uh, online to CCLE uh, and also to Campus Wire. Uh, so, uh, but yes, so this is as proof of this first claim, uh, we have, the, we start from these two properties, we add them up 
and we get to this point where x plus y is between absolute value of x and absolute value of y, and the negative of that number, because that's what we get from the left-hand sides being added. So this is add, both, add all sides. And then when we, from this point, we can conclude that this is a number between this positive number and its negative number. So therefore, the absolute value of the thing in the middle is less than the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. I mean, one could also prove that from the definition of the absolute value by doing some case analysis. Uh, one can't quite do everything. Uh, so uh, now, trying. So this is kind of the first part. The second part, you could say that. Uh, that the, in the second part, we are proving a claim which was our triangle inequality that for every x, y, and z, distance from x to z is less than or equal to distance from x to y plus distance y to z. And there we are using this previous fact. We're using this fact that we established. So we add, where we use it is this transition from uh, this inequality to this inequality. Uh, yeah. Um, so we have a discussion on Thursday, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, it won't, that won't be quite in a lecture format, but uh, so it's more of a discussion, yes. But we will go over some, maybe some examples and things like that. Yeah. There is uh, there is no lecture on Friday. I will also send an update uh, probably tomorrow with a detailed in instruction on the class times. But Friday there will be no class time. You should use Friday though as a chance to look over the videos that I upload. So they will supplement. And there will be some topics that I will not maybe have time to fully discuss in the lectures. Uh, and those may be very good to look at through the supplementary uh, videos. Yeah. Uh, of course, if you are in Asia, and if you, for some reason, are awake at 3 AM, there is a lecture at 3 PM China Standard Time. Uh, Anybody from LA is free to attend. I believe it's uh, so with the 15 hour time difference, it's about, uh, is it midnight in LA that that lecture occurs? So uh, I'm guessing that people have something better to do at midnight in LA. I hope so at least. But, um, okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions now. If you are left with any questions, especially if you after review this topic uh, from the notes, or if you're looking at this video again and you're puzzled by anything, uh, feel free to post it in the chat room. There's a chat room on lecture discussions, uh, or send me a direct message, or post on the newsfeed. There are many options uh, for uh, question. Yeah. Uh, so the examples I showed so far, every space had its own distance function. Uh, as the course goes on, we'll see interactions between different distance functions more. Uh, and, uh, but for now, for each problem, you should be clear what is the distance function. You should define that distance function at the beginning of the problem or it should be given to you. Uh, and you should be clear what you're using. I mean, even uh, I mean, that's the starting point. Once we have multiple distance functions, you have just have to be even more careful. You'll have to be careful about defining exactly which diff balls which, with respect to which distance you're using. So in the examples that I gave of R and R2, we only used the L2 metric and the standard metric. There will be one video at least that will discuss this uh, many other metrics 
on Rn issue. Uh, and uh, next lecture, I could give an example, a little bit of an example about this as well, because it is an important point, but it will become more important towards the end of, not, not quite this week yet, it's not really prominent this week. But just be clear which metric you're using and be aware that there can be other metrics as well. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is, of course, if you're doing applications, you have to be very careful about define, just choosing your correct metric. Um, uh, in uh, abstract context, it's not so, so crucial. Uh, there are often many equivalent metrics in the space. And I haven't defined what it means to be equivalent. Um, so, um, but it looks like there aren't any um, major questions anymore coming in. So if you have any remaining ones, post them on uh, Campus Wire uh, or send me a direct message uh, and then I will try to answer them or get back to them in the future lectures. So thank you for coming and to see you either tomorrow or Wednesday.